Welcome to day two of Diana Initiative. My name is Ray Redacted. I'm going to make some quick announcements, and then we have this amazing keynote coming up with Yolanda Smith. Um, first and foremost, uh, I do want to tell you that we have a we broke several records yesterday. We broke records on ticket sales, on attendance, on the number of countries represented, on speaking, on first time speakers. But I'll, we'll save all that for the closing ceremonies, okay? But a big, massive thanks to our sponsors and to our volunteers. And if you really enjoyed this conference, feel free to throw a few bucks in. It always goes to a good cause like scholarships and future events and always related to women and information security. But again, we'll, we will be circling back on a lot of those events a little bit later. Now, on the first opening keynote raffle, we had this killer prize pack. We had Amanda Berlin's a defensive security handbook. Uh, Tanya Jenkins threw in three months of her killer new website, We Hack Purple. And then Ray Redacted, which is me, threw in one of the books from Tribe of Hackers, sponsored by the Tribe of Hackers podcast, tohpodcast.com. I had to plug that in there. So, uh, And the winner for that raffle was Nade Turi. So Nade Turi, congratulations. You won that one. The closing keynote raffle was pretty much the same package, but we added the Pen Tester Blueprint by Philip Wiley and Kim Crawford. That book has not come out yet, but you will get it sometime later this year. And again, three months of We Act Purple and uh, your choice of a Tribe of Hackers book from the Tribe of Hackers podcast, tohpodcast.com. Winner of that is Gwen McCovey. Now, we also did a whole bunch of other prizes all throughout the day. Uh, lots and lots of good stuff from Hack 5. We had some custom beach towels. We had this crazy blinky blinky thing that went to that went to somebody else. Uh, we had a blue sky IoT thing. And all those prizes are going to continue today. So make sure you enter the raffle for this speech and for every other event. Make sure you hit up the expo. Make sure you go to the Career Village. Just explore it all. There's a lot of stuff that's really amazing that is going on. Now, we also had a social media winner. The grand prize social media winner was Shale Patel. 100 bucks cash money for that particular one. And today you can win the same thing. All you have to do is tweet something that you're enjoying about Diana initiative today with the hashtag Diana initiative and breaking boundaries. And we're going to randomly go through those tweets and give out all kinds of cool stuff that we've gotten from our sponsors. You just don't know what you're going to win because it really just depends on what, what's in the prize bucket. We'll be randomly doing that throughout the day. Now, without any further ado, let me give it off to Jeff. Thanks Ray. Just a quick word about our sponsors. So they're all available out in the Expo Center. So if you want to stop by and learn more about Mongo or Amazon or Microsoft, Verizon, et cetera, go say hi to them out in the Expo uh, tab on there. Next up, uh, a couple quick reminders. Uh, please make sure you stop by the Career Village. They're doing resume reviews, uh, all that kind of stuff on there. You can get a head up on their career. Please check out the Expo Hall, as mentioned. Uh, surveys will show up in the chat for each uh, one of the stages. I'll drop one in here. Feel free to fill those out and help your speaker understand what you liked about their talk. Thanks very much for joining us. Now let's move on to the keynote speaker. Very, very pleased to introduce Yolanda Smith. She's the head of cybersecurity for Sweetgreen, uh, serving over 2 million guests. She's got an impressive resume. She's a veteran of the U.S. Air Force. She served for eight years as a cyberspace security officer, operations officer. Uh, deployed multiple times, so she's got definitely has field experience, and she holds a litany of degrees, literally a litany, and certifications, including bachelor's of science. Uh, she has a master of science in information technology, and she has a numerous certifications as well: GSEC, uh, incident handling, CISSP certifications, and last but not least, let's all wish happy birthday to Yolanda. Like it doesn't get any better. It's also her birthday. So if you see her, be sure to sing happy birthday to her in your best voice. And with that, I will turn it over to Yolanda Smith. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. So as, as Jeff called out, uh, my name is Yolanda Smith, and I'm joining you today safe and sound from beautiful Los Angeles, California. It might be early afternoon for some of you on the East Coast, but I assure you it's very much 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning here. My job here today as your keynote speaker is not just to provide some deep message that you'll take with you forever and ever, sigh, but you'll also get amped and excited about the rest of the cons. So occasionally I'm gonna interrupt my remarks with, by making some horn sounds like this. That's how you know it's time to get amped. 
I've also had some coffee. <laughs> anyway, as Jeff uh, described, I am the head of cybersecurity at Sweetgreen. I'm the very first person to uh, to have that role here. <clears throat> Sorry, slides, there we go. Uh, I'm the very first person to take on this challenge at this company. I'm a military veteran. I'm an activist and supporter of initiatives to get more women and those that identify as such into technology and cybersecurity careers, particularly black women. I'm a barrier breaker and so are you. The theme of this year's Diana Initiative is breaking boundaries bite by bite. <laughs> Can I just tell you that I have been walking around my house for two months going bite, 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 <laughs> bite, 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 bite by bite, breaking boundaries, bite by bite. Um, and I promise you, you're going to be doing that after this is done, if you haven't already. But anyway, when I was asked to be a keynote speaker, I thought a lot about the theme and what it means to be a boundary breaker. I feel like, especially in InfoSec and in cybersecurity, we tend to exalt and uplift the image of the loner, who's more quirkier than others, but who's really good at computers. Those that seem to be able to find the flaws and exploit the assumptions built in the data flows and complex architectures. We celebrate the savants who demonstrate deep knowledge of the ins and outs of a technology, a system, or a process, and can tell you down to the register in the assembly code, the exact point at which an exploit led to a jump, which led to the execution of arbitrary code. In our community, it's just as noteworthy to have a CVE next to your name as it is to have a patent, and to have several makes you one of the, one of the elite. The famed InfoSec rock star. David Bowie is my representation here. That's what I think of when I think of InfoSec rock star. With a highly polished and marketed named vulnerability, you can go from having a couple dozen followers to having thousands seemingly overnight. You'll attract both the adoration and the scrutiny of admirers and trolls who wanna knock you off your pedestal. There's glory in that as well, of course. We often assume that those are the barrier breakers, the folks that were the first, the loudest, the most seen and heard among us but history shows us that that's rarely the case. Today, through examples from my own life and by highlighting folks who operated behind the scenes throughout history, I'm gonna describe what it means to be a barrier breaker. Though we may touch on the individuals who receive the credit for a service or a contribution, we're gonna go a step past that to look at the enabling factors, the circumstances, the actions, and the people which led to the eventualities we all we may all be aware of. This is meant to be food for thought. I fully expect that this will be uh, a discussion for us to talk through in, uh, in one of the networking later. This is meant to be a foundation for a larger discussion and not declarative. So I will present each topic as a premise rather than a statement of fact. So premise one, it's not enough to do it once. Barriers are broken through repeatable patterns and predictable results. My barrier breaking story starts in July of 2007. I had just received my second United States Air Force assignment. Within 60 days, I was to report to Fort Meade in Maryland as part of the 70th Intelligence Support Squadron. For those that don't know, Fort Meade is the home of the National, Cyber Secu or the National Security Agency and the, is the headquarters of what is now the United States Cyber Command. My specific role was unclear. I was gonna be part of a new function called the Advanced Network Operations Group, which was part of the Information Assurance Directorate. None of that meant anything to me. I had no idea what I was getting into or where, really where I was going. I was, I was pretty naive. Neither my current nor my future commanders were able to tell me what I'd be doing, only that we needed to staff the role as part of the Air Force's commitment with the NSA. Suffice it to say, I actually wasn't really excited to go. I was coming from the 48th Fighter Wing, which was based out of the United Kingdom. We had just passed our biannual unit inspection, and I was a young, single, 
uh, Air Force officer that just wanted to to roam carefree across the across Europe, uh, enjoying all the the many uh, uh, indulgences that that I could while I was there legally, of course. <clears throat> As a 23-year-old first lieutenant, I had been named as, as an executive officer, having been taken under the wing of one of the sharpest, most effective leaders I'd ever come across. She was the highest ranking female officer in the command, and she was responsible for the largest mission on the base. She was a complete badass, and I was still very anxious to continue learning from her. But a lieutenant's life is fickle, you go where Uncle Sam tells you to go and when he tells you to go there. So typically for a single officer, you could expect to stay in one assignment for two years before moving on. And my two years was up. I'd initially received an assignment to go to Korea for a one year tour, which I dread so much that I begged my commander to pull some strings to get me out of it. Two weeks later, my commander dropped new orders on my desk to Fort Meade, throwing over her shoulder as she walked out. I can't do anything about this one, LT. You better pack your bags. So in August, I sat nervously in my new commander's office, hoping to learn a little bit more about exactly what I was supposed to be doing for the NSA. In my mind, everything I knew about the NSA came from television. I was convinced that I was going to be in some dark, nasty van in some far flung corner of the earth, listening on, on, uh, on headphones to, to people uh, acting in, in illegal and, and uh, not so helpful ways to our interests. That's what I thought I was gonna be doing, but I would learn differently that the Air Force had a different plan for me. My new commander really couldn't tell me much, only that what I was doing was going to be high on General Keith Alexander's who was the director of the NSA at the time, high on his priority list. I was gonna be the first, and at the time, the only military officer performing the hunting mission on classified systems. I met my civilian counterparts shortly after getting my blue badge, and even they seemed a little unclear on exactly what I was supposed to be doing. While I can't go into the specific intel which led to these conclusions, what I learned was this. Other nations had significantly stepped up their intelligence gathering efforts, specifically in strategic locations and specific, and they were looking at specific information. We wanted to know what they were going after, what they were gonna use it for and why. Being an Air Force member, it stood to reason that I had a better understanding of the command structure and the missions at specific bases and could broker access with individual organizations to get sensors installed, to be able to get the data we needed and see what was happening on these base networks. After installing the sensors, we would run tools that allowed us to pull back data, which would be scrutinized both by intelligence analysts and security engineers to characterize and classify the behaviors we were seeing. Though I didn't totally understand the larger implications of what finding something would mean, I dove headfirst into this assignment. I spent a bunch of time just trying to learn the threat space, why certain data and information might be interesting to specific threat actors, how they might seek to access this information, and what an actual uh, intrusion might really look like. This directly influenced my decision of where to place the sensors. And ultimately, I took up the mantle of being the first mission planner. My previous assignment hadn't prepared me for this at all. To be clear, my very first assignment in the Air Force was in the post office. I had no, I had no plan for how, to, how I was going to do this. So I faced a very steep learning curve to be able to be effective in this role. And I climbed it. I wrote everything down, every process, every analytic tactic, signals, indicators, warnings, all of it. We were starting to generate some buzz and the other services were interested in getting some of their folks in the door to learn how to do hunting. Planning became a, poor, a core part of the hunting process and it started with the initial learnings and experiences we gathered with deploying sensors, identifying uh, clear targets, clear clear places to put those sensors, and being able to understand what information was we were looking at, rather than trying to look at all of it. So, fast forward to 2008. 
I'd applied for and won an opportunity to attend the Air Force's first network warfare training course in Destin, Florida. I'd spent eight weeks learning how to break things on behalf of your taxpayer dollars. And by the time I was done, I was ready to, re to turn my attention back to the advanced network operations shop. When I returned, my new role was as a mission commander working on a watch floor where we were performing active operations to pull data from each of those sensors that I had deployed. By this time, we had sensors deployed in nearly every place that mattered. We'd established a set of processes and protocols for handling and analyzing that data, which made it much easier to spot the anomalies. I walked into the building one chilly morning to find my entire section buzzing. They'd found something overnight. A piece of malware known externally as agent.dtz was attempting to beacon back to a command and control node from our classified network. That's not what you want to see, <laughs> but glad we caught it. <clears throat> it turns out that it had spidered across our air-gapped environments after someone had plugged in a malware-infected USB drive, which was set to auto-run upon being connected. This discovery set off a mad scramble, not just in my department, but across the rest of the NSA, and ultimately the Department of Defense, the services, and the State Department trying to grasp the scope and intent of this infection. This is what became known as Operation Buckshot Yankee. Through our work here, we discovered what, 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 what was at the time the largest breach in U.S. military systems in history. It was this work that precipitated the stand-up of United States Cyber Command, but beyond that, it turned a relatively obscure practice known as hunting into a national resource priority backed by doctrine and executed on the foundational procedures that we built. Without the work of A&O, you don't have cyber mission forces, you don't have cyber protection teams, you don't have cyber combat mission teams, and all the fancy cyber-ish words that you can throw in there, that doesn't happen without A&O doing what they were doing. There were entire security product lines that spawned up on the basis of the work and the processes that we, that we did. It started with a somewhat skeptical but determined lieutenant, that's me. Me, 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 me. <laughs> so in my wildest dreams, I couldn't have imagined or appreciated what hunting would be would come to mean to the security community. But the barrier that was broken wasn't the fact that we were the first or even that we found something. It was that we made it accessible to everyone and we provided a framework to allow us to measure success or failure. The effects of our work reverberated across the DOD, including the Air Force, to which the 92nd Information Operations Squadron pivoted their mission and their practices to account for hunting. They would go on to become the first cyberspace operations squadron supporting the national mission in Cyber Command. Despite all of this, my mostly male counterparts at the time working on the offensive side didn't see the value. They couldn't understand why there was so much hoopla it didn't involve breaking something, and it wasn't the development of some esoteric zero day. So of course, it must be useless. But my story is certainly not unique in that regard, which brings me to my second premise. Premise two, barrier breaking requires tenacity, fearlessness, and vision. Does anybody recognize this person? I hope, I hope some of you do. Each and every one of us in, on this call and in this room, this room that I'm in, owes our careers in some way to this person. Her name is Frances E. Allen. She died on August 4th of this year, her 88th birthday. Though I'm certainly in no position to eulogize her, her story is so compelling, so material to today's discussion that it would be practically dereliction of duty not to bring her up. For those that don't know, Frances Allen is responsible for the design, development, and implementation of the modern optimizing compiler. The reason we have software that works is because of the work that she did. <laughs> I'm going to say that again with different words. Frances Allen created the thing that turns your terrible, high-level, 
human readable code into instructions that an actual machine can understand and execute in a reasonable time frame. I've shared a, le a link to the presentation shown here. In it, she provides a comprehensive breakdown of the evolution of compiler optimization designs through the lens of each project they were used in. Though the explanations provided are fairly straightforward, it's important to note that each compiler design she describes was met with doubt and opposition every step of the way. She excelled. When you think about what she did in the time and in the time in which she did it, her work is nothing short of extraordinary. To put this into context, the first computers became commercially available in the early 1950s. There were a few mom and pop electronics companies that produced commercial computers and IBM wanted to get in on the business. Their first offer offering was a 701, a mainframe, and they were working to develop a programming language called Fortran for their next offering, the 704. Fortran was important because it was one of the first high level programming languages out available. Before this, assembly language was coded by hand. I don't know how many of you took compiler design in school, but doing assembly sucks. It's terrible. Francis Allen joined IBM in 1957. The IBM 650 had just been released. The computer weighed 900 kilograms and the power supply weighed just over 1300 kilograms. That's this, uh, this one over here on the right. That power supply is bigger than the computer. It's crazy. Ms. Allen's job at the time was to teach incoming employees the basics of how to use Fortran, which did have an accompanying com compiler, but it took forever because it was directly translating human language into machine language. And it turns out that 1,000 lines of code translated into 1,000 lines of assembly is incredibly inefficient. And when you have extremely limited processing power, as they did in the late 50s, this was problematic especially for extremely complex numerical calculations and transforms like you might need for say, code breaking. Could have been going on in the 1950s, which might require code breaking. The world will never know. Anyway, two years after she arrived at IBM, she was assigned to work on a contract with the NSA as part of their harvest project and manage the compiler optimization team. Now again, Let's put this into context. Here's a woman, a very smart woman, but a young woman in her 20s in the 1950s telling a bunch of older 1950s dudes that the compiler that they wrote to break codes was too slow and they should move over so she could do it. Then she co-developed and installed a programming language called Alpha, which the CIA used to rapidly detect patterns in almost any spoken language. That's the most baller sentence I've ever spoken out loud. That's crazy. To her credit and the credit of her teammates, their success was predicated on an almost maniacal focus on identifying the problem to be solved, clarifying the desired end state, and doing the math to optimize the Fortran compiler to be able to actually perform its core mission and allow the CIA to automate and accelerate the code breaking process. Of course, this directly contributed to the code making process, specifically the development and testing of some of the early encryption algorithms that we know and love. Ms. Allen, along with her colleague, John Cook, ended up re-architecting and designing abstractions, algorithms and implementations that made automatic program optimization possible which not only laid the groundwork for effective hardware resource utilization, but it also set the stage for another innovation, parallel computing. In the time that Francis Allen was with IBM, they released mainframes for commercial use, developed and delivered personal computers, they created laptops and supercomputers. After demonstrating that compilers could be optimized and thereby more efficient, Ms. Allen turned her attention to automatically optimizing programs, then optimizing program execution with parallel computing, then optimizing processor speed with the Blue Gene Project. This work spanned decades. 
And she did most of it as being the only in the room. And a lot of us know what that's like. For her work, she was the first woman ever to be awarded the Turing Award. That was in 2006. That award is 70 years old. And the first woman to receive it was in 2006. The first one. There have only been three female award winners of the Turing Award ever. 70 years old, by the way. She was also the first woman to become an IBM fellow. She was a fellow for the IEEE and dozens of other organizations devoted to computing. To be able to do all of this under the circumstances she was in must have taken nerves of steel and a level of resolve that is incalculable. She had to be fearless to make this work. Now, IBM's been around for a long time, since 1899 to be exact. And they've always been a little forward leaning when it came to the composition of their workforce, but they're also a company of the times. They've had women involved in every aspect of their business from the very beginning. And while I'm no IBM fangirl, they were pretty, out of, pretty early out of the gates with professional development opportunities designed specifically for women in technology and systems engineering. For a company so long in the tooth, breaking in the upper echelons of leadership and management took quite a while considering how ubiquitous their business is. Their first female board member was the widow of the IBM president. And the first few women in leadership were in, were, came from the sales department. When Frances Allen joined, she might not have been the only woman, but she was certainly the only woman doing what she did in her division. When she first got started, she initially planned to leave IBM after paying off her student loans, but she stayed with it for the challenge provided by the work. She likely had no idea the way her career would evolve, but she labored toward a vision that, that there was gonna be something better, a better way of working, a better way for compilers to compile, a better way for programs to execute. And she allowed that innate curiosity and that vision to drive the evolution of her career. Over the years, she began to champion causes and initiatives to introduce, grow, train and develop women in technology and engineering roles, and additionally, ushered many women into technical leadership roles. Today, IBM's workforce is about 30% women, and I'm certain that that did not come without its fair share of obstacles, which brings me to my next point. Premise three, barriers are in the eye of the beholder. <clears throat> So this year marks the 100th year since women in the United States won the right to vote. For American women, ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, which prohibits the states and the federal government from denying the right to vote to citizens of the United States on the basis of sex, re represents a watershed moment in our history. It must have felt like an exclamation point on nearly 100 years of campaigning, bargaining, pleading, and demonstrating. Every significant woman-centered equality movement from that point forward, from the Equal Rights Amendment to Roe versus Wade, even Miss Magazine and the Women's March can be traced directly back to the moment in history when women secured the ability to vote their own interests and seek out representation similar to their own. That's pretty awesome. Women have proven again and again throughout history, their ability to organize, convene, and act decisively towards a common goal and interest. Now, Susan B. Anthony is widely credited as being the first to lead and take bold steps to really push the suffrage movement forward. In fact, she, along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who presented her Declaration of Sentiments at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848, are commonly referred to as the mothers of the suffrage movement. But there were many people of all genders and races who took risks, often at great personal expense to ensure that women could enjoy this right as much as their male identifying counterparts. In the early 1800s, I'm sorry, in the early 1800s, women like Jarena Lee were attempting to expand their roles and power and have their voices heard in one of the few social outlets they had, church. In May of 1848, Miss Lee and a few other women from her church competed for and won preaching licenses in Philadelphia. 
This accomplishment was a direct influence on the Declaration of Sentiments. This was presented two months later, along with the right, which included along with the right to vote, a demand for equality for women in religion. In the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Frederick Douglass formed the American Equal Rights Association with the expectation that they would advocate for and secure the rights for all Americans, regardless of race or sex, to be able to vote. The US government said, meh, black men the right to vote. And so the 14th and 15th amendments were ratified and women were left to continue their fight for equal rights and treatment under the law. Having failed at gaining equality outright and facing heavy opposition from wealthy East Coast anti-suffrage lobbying groups, the suffrage movement evolved and began to take root in local communities, mostly in the Western half of the United States. These early versions of lean-in circles sprang up across, ne across nearly every state with each one advocating for, and in many cases winning, more and more rights and freedoms for women within their local municipalities and state legislatures. As the movement moved east over a period of decades, suffragette leaders began to encounter resistance to the movement along a singular point. In the South, white women would not accept or acknowledge the movement unless it explicitly excluded black women. As the result, suffrage leaders tooled their message and their outreach to accommodate this, and groups catered specifically to Black women began to emerge around a core set of leaders who continued to seek ways to be part of the larger effort. One of those individuals was Mary Church Terrell, who pleaded at the National American Woman Suffrage Association Convention of 1898 to include more women of color in their efforts. She said, seeking no favors because of our color, nor patronage because of our needs, we knock at the bar of justice, asking for an equal chance. After being shunned from full participation in general suffrage movements and organizations, Ms. Terrell founded and led the National Association of Colored Women and was a chartered member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. These women had to face not only the burden of being discriminated against based upon their race, but also based upon their sex. And they fought in the shadows valiantly for rights they would never fully enjoy until the passage of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act nearly 50 years later. When the 19th Amendment was finally ratified in 1920, Black women like Mary McLeod Bethune, pictured here, exercised those rights under fear, intimidation, and harassment. Looking again at the outcomes born of the suffrage movement, we can see that those women-centered movements in the United States have always centered the needs and interests of white women first and foremost. Miss Magazine is widely heralded as one of the first publications to address the working conditions for female sex workers, highlighting their exploitation and their disparities in pay. The first time we hear that women earn 77 cents to every man's dollar comes in the late 1970s. The first time we acknowledge the pay disparity for Black, Latina, and Asian women is in 1996. When we talk about Roe versus Wade, we must also recognize that this legislation specifically centered the desires of white women to control their bodies and their own healthcare outcomes. Today, Black women encounter medical racism, preventing and complicating their ability to survive generally benign procedures or even receive diagnosis and treatment tailored to their needs and conditions. And it must be stated that even today, when we look at political movements where women are centered, more often than not, the expectation is to resolve the pains facing white women before the needs of any other interest group will be heard. This picture was taken at the first Women's March and it has become almost iconic because it perfectly illustrates the disparity in the gravity of the situation for white women seen in the background taking jovial selfies and cute pink hats, clearly enjoying the moment versus black women in the foreground sitting with the simple blunt truth spelled out waiting, almost resigned, for, almost resigned and waiting for everyone else to see what she sees and taking the seriousness of the moment. But let's bring this back to cybersecurity. 
Over the last five years, there's been a great push to introduce and retain women in cybersecurity, and it's working. Last year, ISC Squared estimated that 24% of cybersecurity roles were being filled by women or individuals who identified as such. But when you dive into that number, the breakout across races is pretty startling. In an industry where security analyst jobs are expected to grow by 18% through 2024, just 3% of the space is comprised by Black people. Less than 1% of the space is comprised by Black women. There are so few indigenous identifying women in cybersecurity that it is statistically zero. Why is that? I get approached fairly often by other black women who are interested in getting into cybersecurity and they wanna know how. I have to be honest, this is actually a fairly tough question to answer and not for any technical reason like go learn networking and you'll get in or go set up a home lab and 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 run, run learn how to, run uh, Metasploit and, and Cobalt Strike. If you do all of those things, you can get in. Not true. The truth is that in a time where there are more roles available than people to fill them, women in general and black women in particular are coming to the table with more education than their white male counterparts, but with less practical training and experience. Experience that comes from getting your foot in the door, and being given the chance to learn, explore, and make mistakes with the benefit of doubt on your side. I won't get into the great certification debate here, but for Black women, the barrier to entry in this community is crazy high. And navigating through it while you watch people who are less educated and qualified, at least on paper, glad hand their way into the industry is frustrating to say the least. Furthermore, if and when they do land a role, they have to find a way to thrive and excel in environments which aren't set up to be truly inclusive and welcoming. The effect of this is that the few Black women who do manage to stick around now have to carry the weight of an entire community on their back while also being excellent at their jobs. And by the way, they have to do so at a value 40% less than their white male peers. So who would want to stay for that? That is not fresh. Sad horn. Meh, 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 meh. That's a sad horn. As I was researching this topic, I came across this image, which includes the slogan from Mary Church, Mary Church Terrell's speech at the 1898 National Association of Colored Women's Convention. It says, lifting as we climb. Those four words say so much about the expectations placed on black women then and now. Because you see, by 1898, the suffrage movement had truly begun to foment across the country but it was directly at the expense of suppressing the needs of a particular group. So while I'm amped to see that there are more women joining the cybersecurity workforce, in the end, I'm well aware that until we start talking about recruiting, developing and retaining non-white female talent, this barrier will continue to keep our organizations less secure collectively, which leads me to our next premise. Premise four, a barrier breaker makes things better for everybody. In 1968, Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman elected to the United States Congress, representing New York's 12th district for seven terms. Though she did not ultimately earn the nomination, she was also the first black woman to compete for a major party's presidential nomination when she campaigned in 1972. Though those were notable achievements, her time as a, slate, a state legislator was especially interesting. Shirley Chisholm was born in Brooklyn to immigrant parents, and grew up in Barbados with her grandmother. She carried a strong West Indian accent and people would try to use that against her as proof that she wasn't American enough, wasn't qualified for the job. Her parents were highly invested and insistent in her becoming well-educated. And after finishing college in the United States, she pursued opportunities to promote early education initiatives and became an authority on issues related to child welfare. Once she turned her attention to politics, she championed causes and legislations which struck down the need to have state literary, li literacy tests in English, saying, just because a person functions better in his native language is no sign that a person is illiterate. Hold on to that, because we're going to come back to it at the end of this talk. She also worked to get unemployment benefits extended to domestic workers and ensure that disadvantaged students could go to college. Shirley Chisholm's first assignment as a member of Congress was on the Agricultural Committee, and she didn't want to do it. 
She wanted to support causes and drive legislation which would benefit her urban district. And in her view, agriculture was not it. But there was something she could get behind, ensuring that the people of her district who faced food insecurity on a regular basis were able to gain access to the country's surplus food supply. She partnered with Bob Dole to expand the food stamp program and was a key architect of the Women Infant and Children program, also known as WIC. In 1972, she, she introduced a bill to provide federal funds for childcare services. Some of you right now are, are probably wishing that that, that that was a thing. This bill ultimately morphed into the Comprehensive Child Development Bill, which was supposed to create a national daycare system, which would enable single parents to work and care for children simultaneously. It ended up being vetoed by the president, Nixon, because it had, quote, family weakening implications. In other words, it would have allowed more women to enter the workforce. The legislation that Shirley Chisholm put forth was meant to specifically benefit the people of the 12th District of New York, but ultimately ended up benefiting people across the whole country. Through consistent partnership and coalition building, not to mention capitalizing on the opportunity to make the most of an unexpected assignment, Congressman Chisholm drove true systemic change on a national stage in a relatively short amount of time. How does that Hamilton song go? Immigrants get the job done. And ultimately, millions of families benefited from her work. I can tell you that my family required the assistance of the WIC program as I was growing up. Speaking of WIC and food insecurity, the topic of food insecurity is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, especially now. I work for a company whose mission is to connect people to real food. When the COVID crisis really started to ramp up, we racked our brains trying to figure out how we could continue to deliver on our brand promise in a way that was safe for both our guests and our team members. We quickly introduced new safety and health protocols, including temperature scanning for both team members and guests across our fleet. And the inevitable question came up, what do we do with the data? How do we conduct contact tracing and inform people that they may have been exposed? How do we protect that information? Now, I'm no healthcare professional, but I'm vaguely aware that anything construed to be medical data deserves more protection than the average bear. Incidentally, I'm delighted, and I hope you'll be delighted as well, to know that I've introduced privacy bills to dictate who may collect COVID-related data which mechanisms they may use to collect it, and how long it must be stored, who can have access to that data, and the appropriate disclosure in the event that a positive test is discovered. If you haven't already read the recommendations from Access Now here on the left, I'd highly recommend it. I've included a link to it at the bottom of this slide, and these slides will become available to you at the end of this talk. When the crisis first hit, I approached other cybersecurity leaders in my industry with these questions to see what they were doing. So sidebar, I'm the head of cybersecurity for a multi-billion dollar company, yet my peers in this space are overwhelmingly white and male. Why is that so important? Because when I ask the question, how are we, how are we ensuring that we can preserve people's privacy while still keeping them safe? The answer I got back was focused almost exclusively on technical measures encryption in transit, encryption at rest, blah, blah, blah. It occurred to me, once again, that these men had never had to deal with the actual safety ramifications of having their data exposed. None of them had been harassed or doxxed or stalked. None of them were concerned about what impact a health insurance fraud could do to a person and thus didn't really get the gravity of what data exposure in the time of COVID could really mean for their teammates or their guests. They're not bad people, and I don't want to paint them that way, but they simply had no frame of reference to even consider that as a potential impact. While being hyper-focused on doing the normal security things, what they didn't see was that there was an entire community that wasn't necessarily being served, and there was an opportunity to put themselves on even stronger footing security-wise by considering all of the ramifications beyond just unauthorized exposure of data. We can see the consequences of what happens when these barriers are in place in tech. I'm sure everyone recalls a situation when Google rolled out their image, uh, their image search tool uh, and it inappropriately associated black people with gorillas. 
I'm sure everyone recalls the situation with Amazon's hiring screener, which disproportionately screened out women and people with ethnic sounding names. I'm sure everyone remembers that time Snapchat rolled out a lens that would allow you to perpetuate digital blackface, only to see them double down two months later with the lens that perpetuated yellow face. In all of these situations, we have to ask, who was in the room when that decision was made? We speak in these lofty terms about the importance of diversity and inclusion, but especially in security, the value of having more voices in the room early in the decision-making process and at all leadership levels ends up creating more secure products, more secure services, more secure applications overall. How? I'll use an anti-example. If a product, system, or service is built with the assumptions of a particular user group, and we're, and we're working under the assumptions that that user group will use it in a specific way, then we can exploit that product by having non-users, non-targeted individuals, try to use that system in a, in a different way to solve a different problem, a, pro a problem not specified in the docs. We're humans. Technology is built with human biases embedded. By building more inclusive teams, we're able to expose those biases more quickly allowing us to develop countermeasures to prevent them from being exploited. So what does it mean to be a barrier breaker? Let's revisit our premises. Number one, it's not enough to do it once. Barriers are broken through repeatable patterns and predictable results. Number two, barrier breaking requires tenacity, fearlessness, and vision. Number three, barriers are in the eye of the beholder. And number four, a barrier breaker makes things better for everybody. When we look at the examples, the barrier breaking examples from these stories, whether it be in threat hunting, developing and optimizing compiler, fighting for the right to vote or ensuring that children had equal access to education and a consistent food source, we can see that they all have a few things in common. The people involved in all of these situations displayed courage, grit, will and perseverance to overcome the so-called barrier in order to achieve a common goal. In their time, most of these people were not wildly popular, nor were they so-called rock stars. What the rest of history may call out as their legacy were probably relatively uninteresting events in their daily lives. Each of them built coalitions and teams of similar, similarly inclined individuals, all of whom wanted to achieve the same goal and were ready and willing to devote their energy to it. None of the folks that I brought up today set out to be rock stars or to be barrier breakers. That occurred as a byproduct of a lived life marked by sustained, consistent, purpose-driven cause and initiatives. Don't those qualities sound familiar? They should. These are all the qualities that we expect and demand of anyone who's involved in cybersecurity. So I suppose I owe you a call to action. Hopefully, by now, I've made my case to any skeptics that to break a barrier isn't one specific act, but a series of acts sustained over a purpose-driven career. It is the mundane, unspecial things that we do every day. It is a culmination of circumstance, preparation, planning, prior acts, vision, drive, and teamwork, which make it possible to overcome an obstacle and break through to the other side. You know, there's a bit of an attitude uh, in security that there's nothing innovative happening right now, that we're trapped in a live version of the stainless steel rack. I disagree with that to an extent. I think for as long as humans build technology with biases baked in, and yes, even AI has bias baked in, there will never be, there will be ever evolving ways to exploit these biases, which will ultimately drive innovation. So I don't really have a call to action except for this. Dream big but act small. Be undeterred by doubters and naysayers. There is no need to set your sights on becoming a barrier breaker because you are already doing it. I've been seeing lots of discussion around gatekeeping and who's really in security versus who isn't. And I just want to say this, whether you have one CVE or dozens, whether you've been doing this for 10 minutes or 20 years, you belong here. And we need you and your talents, your skills, and your experiences to be a part of this community and to help shape it into something that reflects the world we actually live in. Your job right now is to remain focused, driven in your purpose, and to bring in as many people as you can with you so that boundary becomes less and less significant until it withers away. 
My name is Yolanda Smith. I'm the head of cybersecurity at Sweetgreen. I'm a barrier breaker and so are you. I wanna thank all of you for joining me today. It just so happens that today is my birthday, yay. And I couldn't think of a more awesome way to celebrate it. If you're joining me from one of the many cities where we operate, surprise, Sweetgreen will be treating you to lunch. We'll work with the conference organizers to put up a distinct Google form so we can send you your unique discount code. I'll be headed over to the Career Village after this, just in case some folks want to talk with me and are interested in breaking barriers with me over at Sweetgreen. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So I also, I'd be happy to connect with you uh, via any of the methods listed here. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much, Alana. Wow, that was an amazing talk. You covered a lot of ground, uh, a lot of good comments uh, in the uh, in the chat there. Uh, we did have one question that I was able to capture uh, there. So what are some good, uh, Joe Titos asks, what are some good historical texts or resources that you would recommend to those of us who want to learn more about women and people of color in cyber and science? Mm. So, so I ended up pulling a whole heck of a lot of information, believe it or not, from the, I, the IBM archives. Once the, once the talk is over, I'll send you a link. Um, maybe I'll throw it in the, uh, uh, in the networking uh, village. But uh, there's a, the, the IBM archives actually covers a whole heck of a lot of ground. They actually list every single one of the individuals in the women in their company that actually came and went from IBM and had notable achievements in computing. I use that to spider out and look at look at more information specifically about women in technology. There's also a couple of books on Amazon that I can recommend that talk about you know those early women in, in technology and what their lives were like in the 1950s and early 60s when when they were you know they were the programmers you know swapping out punch cards in those giant computers. Happy to send you a couple of links to that there. It's amazing. <laughs> I can't imagine having to uh, work in technology without, uh, you know, the help of VS Code and all the things we have today. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know how I would uh, ever get anywhere. <laughs> uh, another question, uh, Brianna asks, how do you manage uh, self-doubt? It's pretty common for me to feel like I'm not really into cybersecurity because I don't have an impressive resume or degree. Yeah, that's that's a really great question. And I'll, I'll be real honest, I struggle with it. I I struggle with it. That little voice inside my head sometimes does take over and says, "You're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not. You're not supposed to be here." But the way that I handle it and manage it is to really focus in not on the that feeling um, and and what I don't have. I try and flip the script and focus in what on what I do have. It's so important, especially now when we're in this weird space with COVID. To, to not just focus on the things that you don't have and the, and, the, and the losses, but to focus on the positives and to focus on what you do have. Um, whether or not you have an impressive resume, you're, you're working towards building your resume and you're working on learning something. Rather than focusing on the, hey, my resume doesn't look like this yet, focus in on the fact that, hey, after three months of hard learning and hard, hard uh, uh, trials and tribulations, you know more today about XYZ subject than you did yesterday. That's awesome. If, if, if you can celebrate that, if you can learn something new every single day, that's a thing to celebrate. And that's ultimately what makes you a better part of this community is because you're actively working to build up and you're actively working to become someone that does have that impressive resume and that does have the ability to, to, to be um, you know, sort of had that gravitas to speak on on a larger larger scale. I'll, I'll throw this out too. All of us were 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 newbies at one point. I consider myself a perpetual newbie. Everyone started from someplace. Don't I would say don't get in the habit of comparing yourself to what everyone else is doing. You focus on you. You focus on what you're doing and where you're trying to go in your journey, and you'll get there. It'll take step by step. But if you try and compare yourself to what everyone else has, it, it, it's going to get tough. That's great. And I love the example you had earlier of uh, documenting all the threat hunting uh, that you were doing and how that became the, the standard for how to do it. That's great. <laughs> uh, See, so next uh, question from uh, Katty Monk. Uh, she's wondering, how do we fix the retention problem? The retention problem, this is the Alana Smith opinion, okay? 
the retention problem comes from building an inclusive culture. And I know we think, you know, we're we're in this moment of, you know, Black Lives Matter and we have the, the, the attention of everybody, but it really does become calling people to the table, as many people as possible. I'm a hiring manager. And one of the things that I have challenged myself every single time I go into an interview is to think about what voice, <clears throat> what problem am I trying to, what problem am I trying to solve when I hire someone? And what voices are not represented that can help me solve that problem? I, the the pie graph I put up earlier shows that, frankly, the the the, the people that that have identified themselves as being in infosec are overwhelmingly white and male. <clears throat> and when you consider the fact that, hey, I'm trying to bring in more inclusive voices, I'm trying to bring in more people who are interested in in in, in diversity and making sure that we're fully solving the security problem. How do I address their needs and how do I really think about things from a different perspective? That's really where you can start chipping away at the retention problem is when you start saying, hey, you know, who, who am I surrounded by every single day? What, what am I reading every single day? What sources of information am I, am I curating and cultivating and how do I switch that up so that way I'm getting different perspectives? Right. And then honestly, it's about being vulnerable. And I know saying vulnerable to a bunch of people who are in security is, is kind of a faux pas, but you have to be vulnerable and recognize what you don't know and recognize that you don't have it perfect. Be willing to apologize and be willing to to be honest about where you are and where you want to be. Um, everyone makes mistakes, but ultimately it's the act of working to 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 evolve over time that allows us to 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 build those inclusive environments which make retention a much easier problem to solve that's the honest method thank you got uh, just a couple more minutes and uh, and two more questions so i think we'll be able to get through uh so next one uh, from victoria richardson so yolanda how do you remind yourself that you're doing enough and you deserve to give yourself credit i always forget to do that mm. yeah <laughs> How do, I, how do I remember to give myself credit? You know, so uh, I take little wins and I take big wins. Um, when I uh, when I got my job at Sweet Green, I took a big win. I bought myself something nice, and um, I'll tell you, I'm a I'm a, a, a home brewer, and I I tend to collect uh, uh, beers. And I opened up one of the beers that I'd collected, um, and I I consumed it. That's that. I felt like, hey, I accomplished something that was nice. That's a that's a big win, and I'm gonna I'm gonna celebrate that win. Um, the the small wins happens on an almost um, daily basis for for me. Um, it's getting through <laughs> it's getting through the no kidding mountains of email and recognizing that I helped one person solve a problem. I I made the company just a little bit more secure. I I educated just one more person in how to not click on a phishing email or what to look look for when we do see phishing or hey somebody ultimately got um got fished how do i make sure that they understand what the ramifications are if i can if i can help educate if i can help make it a little bit better i feel pretty good that i'm doing my job and that i've done enough ultimately i, I i'll be honest I, I never feel like it's enough but i have to be able to sleep at night so i do take those i do grasp at those little tiny things um, in order to to help me feel like I'm making some progress at least. Okay, great, great. Last question, and uh, feel free to take this offline if you want. But uh, Sadie Gauthier, I think Gauthier is the right administration, was asking, just curious, what made you leave the DOD? Let's take that offline. <laughs> Maybe a longer story. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very, very much for this talk. It was great. It was like I said, lots and lots of good comments uh, in the in the um, in the chat, and I'm sure people will be uh, connecting with you uh, later. Just a program note before we uh, cut off to the next session. Uh, we're going to delay the closing keynote by just a half hour today in order to give all the tracks and sessions time to finish up, so everybody can attend the closing keynote. Uh, so that's uh, gatekeeping, gaslighting, and grieving. Very, very interesting talk coming up, and uh, it'll be at 4.30 uh, Pacific time p.m. Again, thank you very much, Alana, for your talk. And again, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.